Mr. Rasponi, thank you so much for joining us here on This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me, Avery. I appreciate that. Well, you're running for governor. What made you decide to say, you know what, I've had a successful business, I've, I've gone forward with that, but now I want to step into the public arena? Yeah, I, let, me, let me start with this. I'll give you a little quick bio of myself, mm -hmm. you know. I grew up in North Baton Rouge, where Standard Oil established themselves, and I think it's 1909. And so I grew up in a blue collar family of nine and a thousand square foot home, attic fan, one bathroom. At one point there were six children in there and I always tell people my mother was a saint. And my dad worked at Standard Oil, eventually became humble and all that. And he, uh, you know, so I knew at a very early age if I wanted spending money or transportation or to go to college, I'd have to have a job. So. Mm -hmm. I got a job at 15 working construction during the summers. My oldest brother was already out of the house working construction. So I worked every summer during high school and then I worked my way through college and got a degree in construction from LSU and then worked all over the country for quite a few years and then about 30 years ago my youngest brother and I started a company we have today. It's called ISC Constructors. Mm -hmm. And we started with three individuals, three of us, in my living room and today we employ almost 4,000 families. So we've been very, very blessed. On the personal side, my wife and I were both widowed in the early 2000s, and we've been married 13 years, and we have seven married children, 24 perfect grandchildren is what I tell people. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's kind of the background there. And then mm -hmm. people say, well, how does someone with your station in life, in this stage in life, with 24 grandchildren decide to run for governor? And what happens when John Bell got elected, you know, I, of course I was disappointed. But what happened is that in the first session, he, uh, he tried to cut the budget or defund the scholarship program that allows uh, low-income children to escape failing schools and go to a private school. And it just really um, got to me. You know, mm -hmm. It got bothered me a lot because I spent a lot of time trying to help children get educated. And then right after that, it, he started this lawsuit abuse on the oil and gas, killing thousands of jobs. And then I got to the point where I was debating John Bell Edwards in the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep. I said, man, this guy's going backwards. And then he, he went after the ITIP program and threw it in chaos. Never spoke to the industry, the manufacturing industry. Never spoke to the uh, school boards or the police, I mean, the sheriff the, uh, organization, anything. Just threw it in chaos and lost thousands of jobs and sent a shockwave through the industry. So I was really got to the point where I said, this guy's he's driving us jobs out of town. I mean, he's killing our state, you know. So I went to my wife and I said, what do you think about me running for governor? And she didn't think that was too good of an idea. <laughs> and I've told this story all over the state. So I backed off. I said, okay. I actually kind of felt relieved a little bit. If she's not in, I'm not in, you know. So we looked around and tried to find someone that would really go against John Bell Edwards and all this trial lawyer money and what he was doing. And really couldn't find that person, but we kept looking, we asked around trying to get someone to do it. But what really pushed us over the edge, with me over the edge, was with 24 grandchildren, we have many opportunities to be with them. Mm. And, uh, you know, whether it's a nutcracker, birthdays, first communions, you name it, we have plenty of opportunities to be with them. And I'm always grateful how blessed we were. But I was at a grandparents' day, one of the schools here, where we have six grandchildren there. And I was watching these grandparents dote over these children. And they're p thinking about it. I said, they have grandparents that love them, nurture them. They have parents that love and nurture them. And they're in a good, in this case, good Christian school, receiving a good academics and Christian faith um, education. And God taps me on the shoulder and he says, Eddie, what about the 130,000 plus children DNF schools? And if you knew anything about me for the last 12 years or so, I've really spent a lot of effort treasure and time trying to give every child an opportunity to receive a quality education. Because my wife and I realized when we did the experiment that, uh, you know, it's more than just the social economics behind it, you know. These children do not have hope if they do not receive a quality education. And how do we expect them to know about eternity and God if they have no hope? So God knew this was on my heart. And so it got to the point when I was around my children I would feel, I don't want to say guilty, but I was not doing what God wanted me to do, help these children in a bigger way. And so I went back to my wife and explained that to her. 
And I asked her, I said, would you mind praying on that again? And she did. And she came back to me several weeks later. I don't remember if it was five weeks, four weeks or whatever. And she said, okay, I'm in. I understand. I know what we have to do. And peace came over both of us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tell people when you, when you listen to God and you answer his request, you do have peace. Not that this is not easy. It is a challenge to do this, especially at this stage in life. But we're both at peace with it, and we've committed to do what God wants us to do. And that's, that's to create a future for our children and grandchildren and all of our children and grandchildren in Louisiana. And we deserve that. They deserve that. You know, we should be number one in the South when it comes to jobs and opportunities. And opportunity is a big part of that. And uh, that's what we're here for, to you know, turn this state around. And really, uh, it boiled down to our faith. That's why we're in this race. And people ask me that all the time, and I tell them, mm -hmm. that's the truth. I'm not afraid to say that, you know. It's not an ego trip. Mm -hmm. Believe me, it's not an ego trip. This is trying to do what he wants us to do. I know a lot of farm families are very deeply rooted in their faith, and there's also a strong education that can happen out on the farm. Uh, you know, whenever you're, you're leading that cow back on the show ring, sometimes it's going to run off, and it might hit you the wrong way. You learn something at that yeah. point. Tell me a little bit about your connections with agriculture. We were talking earlier about, you know, you do have some pretty close ties. You know, I would say this. Uh, my, my grandparents were, are both sides. My mother and father's parents were strawberry farmers in Tanspoe Parish. Amy, actually. And so my dad grew up doing that with him and his brothers and sisters. My mother did the same thing. I mean, they worked out there. So we used to go and, and be a part of that. And I learned very early age how to pick strawberries and pack them and bring them to the rail station to send them up to Chicago and, and then all the, the, the uh, I guess you call them the, the, uh, the fruits and stuff. I mean, the bell peppers and things would go to New Orleans most of the time. So my dad always had a garden, so I did those things as well. And I learned those things and work in the garden, follow my grandfather around with a mule and everything else. So it was, it's close to me. It's in our family, the farming side of it. And then just recently, uh, you know, I guess it's been about six years ago, I bought some property, timber property. And so I really have learned a lot about that part, that part of the agriculture and what it means and what it, you know, how you plan, you thin the forest and you, you have to mark the timber. I also learned that, you know, you don't make what you think you're going to make on the timber and the, and the product goes up and down and, it's, and it takes a while. And we've also planted quite a few acres, maybe 100, 200, about 200 acres of soybeans and sometimes corn, you know, for self-consumption for, mm -hmm. our, for our wild game. So I've learned about the planting and the, and the spraying and, and what it means to pay for the seed and the fertilizer and all the fuel and, you know, the, the, the fact of what these farmers go through. And, and it's in a smaller scale, but you learn what the weather plays in that. It's mm -hmm. too dry, too wet. And so they, they go through a lot. It's a lot of hard hours, you know. When they start, you got to go around the clock almost. So, And then I also own some uh, a farm property that I actually lease out and it's been very interesting to work with the farmers that we lease it to and see what their life is like as well. So I have a connection there on the forestry side and on the farming side as well. Haven't messed with cattle, <laughs> not going there. Uh, I got a lot on my plate to be messing with cattle. I've heard that normally cattle becomes a habit and you have to, uh, you really have to feed it once you start. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, uh, we have quite a few of our superintendents, uh, well, actually construction managers in the cattle, they do it on the mm -hmm. side. They, they, they may have like four or five hundred head, right. and it's a big deal. It's a full-time situation for them. You brought up about buying the feed, the seed, the fertilizer, those sorts of things. Currently, those are all exempt from uh, state sales. sales tax. We had a bunch of people looking at those ag exemptions uh, whenever there was a budget crisis in the yeah. state. What would you do as governor to help protect those ag exemptions? We'll, we will protect those. I, I, I was visiting with Brent Alon, mm -hmm. and he was one of the senators that stepped in there and said, guys, let me explain something to y'all. And so he's the one that kind of led that charge to get that off the, off the table to make sure we protect that. You got to keep us competitive. I mean, our farmers have to be competitors with the rest of the country as well. So we just, that's the way I look at everything. Louisiana is blessed with great natural resources. And so we have to do everything possible to keep us competitive with the rest of the country. And that's one reason why I want to have the limited constitution, well, the constitutional convention, is to make sure we're competitive. You know, rewrite it and make sure that we're competitive with the rest of the country. One of the places where it's tougher to be competitive is with ag haulers. A lot of oh them are God. having trouble staying in business because of high input costs, but also because of high insurance rates. What would you do to help protect our ag haulers across the state? Well, 
I think it's all of them, Avery. I think it's all of them. You know, our auto insurance is the second highest in the country. And we have a, and I hate to say it in that way, but I'm not ashamed to say it, we have a plaintiff attorney as a governor who is completely beholden to our liberal trial lawyers who have been controlling our legislature way too long, particularly in the Senate. And so we have to do something totally different. And it's going to take a governor that's not beholden to special interest, someone that has the backbone to go after this and, and fix that problem. And uh, it's not going to be that difficult to know what needs to be done because we can look at Mississippi, you know, their liability insurance is a third of what ours is. You know, you can go to Georgia even, find out it's that much cheaper. People moving in Louisiana, you know, we have loggers, I mean, we, excuse me, we have um, heavy haulers that haul equipment and do hauling. They're actually looking to buy property in Mississippi and Arkansas and Texas and move their business there and still haul in Louisiana because of the liability insurance. So we, I'm not going to wait. The first session, we're going to go fix that. We are going to go fix that. With this new legislature, both the House and the Senate, and me as governor, we're going to go fix that. How would you go fix that? Well, first of all, we're going to go in and just, you call it tort reform, but Kurt Talbert had a bill that came out of the House with almost a supermajority, and it got killed in the Senate with John Lario and the governor and a bunch of trial lawyers. Well, that won't happen next time. And what we're going to do is go back and look at that bill and expand it. We're going to get everything in there that we need in order to move our state forward when it comes to liability, insurance on auto liability. Because it's the loggers that are getting killed, it's the farmers, when the cane farmers are paying upwards of $15,000 just for a 100-day grind. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. The heavy haulers, some of them are almost going out of business. Some of them had to refinance their trucks to cover it. You know, they're struggling to do those things. And the thing that's not being talked about, though, is the middle and low-income families. Imagine that. You and I, we, we're fortunate to have a good job. It just aggravates us to pay extra $2,000 per year for car insurance. But think about the families that are low- and middle-income families. It's causing them to lose their job in a lot of cases because they're getting a bind. They're already getting the minimum insurance. They're getting a bind with, with the essentials and they wind up not paying their car insurance and, they, and the department, of, they, they suspend their license, DMV suspends their license, next thing you know they got a big fine, they can't pay it, they get the license pulled and now they can't get to work. You know, that's not being talked about, but that's a big problem. I'm talking to the insurance company, he said it's a revolving door. You know, they lose their license, they get it back, lose their license, get it back. Then I talk to the people that are, the companies that are working them and giving them employment and it says now it's getting a problem where they can't keep their jobs because they can't show up. So those are the things as governor I'm going to fix. You know, we're going to go out and get what needs to be done and we're going to get that passed in the first session. You're talking about people getting around. Right now a lot of our farmers and our timber folks are having trouble getting their crops around, uh, be it lo uh, log trucks not able to cross bridges because they're That's posted good. or in the case of uh, what happened in St. Martin Parish where they had a bridge out for a number of uh, months and had to take a completely different route to get the sugar cane out last season, yeah. all the way to the Sunshine Bridge getting hit and causing right. folks to have to go 100 miles to get their crop. Let's talk about infrastructure and rural uh, roads, bridges, and broadband. What would you do as governor to, to shore up that rural infrastructure? Well, it, it's all infrastructure. It's really the whole infrastructure of Louisiana. The roads and bridges are in bad shape and we have not prioritized it properly. And as governor, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna quit spending tax dollars, gasoline tax dollars on salaries and benefits. We're gonna put that back in the roads and bridges like we told the people would do. And so that comes to about 130 plus million dollars a year. And so with that dollars, you can parlay it with federal dollars and we could be looking at three to 400 million a year right off the bat. The other side of the coin is the capital outlay. Again, I've talked to some of the senators as well, and Brent was one of them, Brett rather. And what we can do there, I th we, can, we can actually allocate dollars out of that every year to roads and bridges. And let's just say we get 150 million that we know we're gonna put there every year. And then you parlay that as well. So you could be looking at six to seven, eight hundred million dollars a year. But the, 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 uh, the way we're gonna approach it is gonna be totally different. Not only do you have the money, put it where it's supposed to go in roads and bridges and not in parks and all these pet projects, but we're going to do everything's going to have to have a uh, feasibility study. And then it's going to have to have a cost benefit, take the politics out of it. So I could see sitting down 
with an area, a farming area, and look at all the roads there, and let us sit down and say, okay, let's do a study of this. Which bridges are the most critical? And we're going to value those bridges, and then we're going to look at the cost-benefit of that. And then we're going to allocate that based on jobs, based on feasibility studies, not on politics. You know, we have, I can give you stories where you got one politician that getting a money to 20, 30 million dollars to go spend on a lake when he should have been spent on infrastructure somewhere else, but he's been in the legislature a very long time and has all the favors. That alone is going to make a huge difference. You go to the areas and you sit down with them and say, which most critical? Let's do a feasibility study and then a cross benefit. And then you do it, take the politics out of it, do what's best for the citizens. And that's what it takes. It takes someone that's got the confidence and not beholden special interests and do it the right way. What about broadband in rural areas? You know, they're talking about rolling out 5G. Yeah. That's a, a much tighter bandwidth, so it doesn't have the range as some of the others, but your thoughts on getting that into some of you our know, rural You know, that's areas. really an important uh, infrastructure, and it's, it's important infrastructure to create jobs and to grow companies and also for education. You know, it, it, you get it to the schools before you get it into, into the business community. So I think we, we definitely have to expand that and make sure we complete that circle. Because you can go and general, you can, you can uh, start up companies here. We, we, we ship product, talking about finished products, whether it's fabrication of panels or valves or whatever, all over the world now. And so we can go in there and get the talented people and work there and with the broadband, and you can run your business accordingly and use the locals, the skilled labor, and do the education training there and bring the economy to these rural areas. That's from a job creation standpoint. From an education standpoint, you can bring in the education where science teachers and math teachers, and you can pipe that in, so to speak, and use it now with the internet, if you have the broadband there, and bring up the skill set of these young people. Agriculture is very important to the state of Louisiana. The latest numbers show in 2018 it had an 11.7 billion dollar impact on the state's economy. As governor, would, what would you do to help keep the whole industry going and your thoughts and plans for agriculture in your first four years? Pretty much what we just discussed, okay? And it's going to be the infrastructure. It's going to take the politics out of that. It's going to be bringing the broadband out and working with them because they use it a lot as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be lower net car insurance and automobile insurance so they can do those things. Education has got to be very, very important working with that. So it's, it's, a, it's raising the whole economy of Louisiana as well. And if you do that, everything flows with it. You know, you're raising mm -hmm. your tax base so we're not, you know, we're not playing games with the tax uh, exemptions that we have now. Just raise the whole economy, raise everything up. The other thing, too, is that you know, we have to have a constitutional convention to look at local government. We have to move more responsibility, I won't say responsibility, but control on the local level so they can prosper and make their own decisions. We have a constitution that's really a book of statutes. You know, it's not truly a constitution. And so we have to allow them that opportunity to run their own government and take the shackles off of them. We tell them, we give them mandates and don't fund it and things of that nature. The economy, in, and it's not just in Louisiana, but it's changed in the last, obviously, last 50 years or so. You know, the farms are bigger. The population is going down in the small rural areas. We have to raise the education levels in there so they'll have opportunities. Uh, and all of us, I mean, you know, our parents and grandparents, they came off the farms and came to where the bigger jobs were. You know, and the farms are getting bigger and bigger now. And so we just have to address it accordingly and make sure that we, we're conscious of these small towns and what they need and uh, try to bring things to them and grow it. Well, I know a lot of us have been watching TV and seeing the ads and, you know, lots of, lots of political ads sometimes don't say the nicest things about people, but I want to make sure this interview ends on a positive note. What are a couple of positive things you could say about the other major, your opponents in this race? I would say this about both of them. This is John Bell Edwards and Congressman Abraham. Both of them are good family men. Both of them have been married to the same lady for a long time. Both of them are like me. They married over their heads. We're very blessed. And so that's a big deal. They both love their families and they're, they're solid citizens when they come to their families. 
Uh, obviously, uh, in, in John Bell's case, he is a totally different when it comes to policy. He is a tax and spend liberal career politician, as I call it. Government can fix everything. You just keep growing government, raising taxes. And so, uh, but I know that that's, that's sincere about him. That's just him. You know, he's a good family man, and, and uh, you have to respect that. Uh, he's also very personable as well, as you probably have already known. Uh, Congressman Abraham obviously is the same way, good quality person, lives, you know, good family man, loves his family and grandchildren like I do. Uh, you know, he's been a hard working person all his life as well, you know. I think he's more of a policy person than he is someone to step in and take over a $30 billion operation. And so I, I look at it that way, you know, I'm looking at one as policies and one's, you know, different policies and one has similar policies, but there's only one person here that started a business with three and has a, almost $4,400 million in revenues and really has the skill set to, to take on a $30 billion operation and turn it around. And then someone is not beholden to special interest that has the backbone to do something different, similar to what's happened with, with Donald Trump with the United States. You know, he just gets in there and makes things happen. And that's, that's why I'm in this race, you know, the future for Louisiana, for our children and grandchildren, so they'll stay here and be proud to call Louisiana home, you know. That's it. I mean, this, this is where it's happening right now. Well, Mr. Rasponi, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and uh, spend a little time and let our, our members get to know you. I appreciate you having me. I really do. You do well, doing well here. Appreciate it.